1962, the Mafia car bombing of Cadillac Charlie Cavallero and his two young sons rocked the city of Youngstown and rattled the nation. Boys, come on. Over 60 years later, for the first time ever, the sole survivor of the bombing, Charlie Cavallero Jr., and a former FBI agent who worked the case, will break it all down with Youngstown Mob Talk, plus a VIP dinner before the show. Don't miss this once-in-a-lifetime event. Cav Bomb, Friday, November 10th. Tickets available now at StambaUditorium.com. You're watching an amazing podcast from an amazing podcast company. Hello, everybody. Johnny Ciccatelli here for another edition of Youngstown Mob Talk. As you can tell, I'm flying solo today, but I actually will be joined by a special guest a little later uh, coming up real soon here on the show. But, of course, my partner in true crime, Jimmy Naples, uh, he couldn't be here today, but... You know, I'm just going to dive right into it. This week's Mob Talk. Um, I'm going to start off by thanking our sponsors, of course. We've got Youngstown Tile and Terrazzo. They've been a wonderful sponsor for us. We really appreciate them. We hope you guys check them out, you know, for spectacular flooring. Go bold, go local, go Youngstown Tile. Uh, of course, we've had the River Rock at the Amp in Warren. was a big sponsor all summer long. If you guys didn't come out to the Amp this summer, you missed it because... They had some amazing shows, uh, great bands, great atmosphere at the Amp out there in Warren. So a huge thank you to the River Rock at the Amp. They were fantastic. And, uh, you know, last but not least, the Sunrise Inn out in Warren. The best food in Warren. Um, the burgers are unbelievable. They're huge. Uh, I love it. The pizza is phenomenal. Uh, everything you get at the Sunrise Inn is, is really fantastic. And it has a lot of local mob history uh, just if you go there right now, uh, you'll see some old, you know, mobsters on the, uh, some gangsters on the wall, some pictures. So, you know, ask, maybe ask uh, if you see the owner or if you see any uh, waitresses or anybody, ask him who are these guys on the wall and they'll tell you some stories. So check out the Sunrise Inn and thank you to all of our sponsors. You know, today I'm going to get right into it. We have a guest coming up, but first uh, I want to talk about our post of the week. If you're not a member already of our Youngstown Mob Facebook group, what are you waiting for? you got to join this group. Uh, we're over 30,000 members in just a year. So we've really grown this thing. And, you know, people post some amazing pictures and stories, questions, and, you know, all kinds of phenomenal stuff about Youngstown's mob history. You're going to find it right there on Facebook in the Youngstown Mob group. So search Youngstown Mob. And, uh, and click join because we really do. We have, we have so many great stories and posts in there every week. Uh, this week, our post of the week comes from Don Corbett, uh, you know, retired police officer from the area, private investigator. He actually posted uh, a picture of several books on Youngstown's organized crime history. Uh, great for research, great for anybody who just wants to learn more uh, maybe it's a hobby that you want to you want to find out more about the the organized crime history, the mob history here in Youngstown. Dawn posted a picture with some phenomenal books. Um, I just want to add to that real quick. You know, there's a couple that he didn't have it included on there. Um, you know, first and foremost, uh, the former Youngstown police chief Eddie Allen uh, wrote a book called Merchants of Menace: The Mafia. And that's a very, um, very informative book from the time that he was the chief of police in Youngstown, which was the late 40s to the early, mid, early and mid 50s. Um, so you'll hear a lot about, if you read that book, you'll see a lot about Joe DiCarlo, uh, Sandy Naples, all those guys. Um, that's called Merchants of Menace. I highly recommend you check that out. There's another one by a former FBI agent uh, I believe he was the head of the uh, the FBI office in Cleveland for a while. Uh, his name was Joe Griffin, and his book is called Mob Nemesis. I recommend you check this book out because there's a lot of good stuff in there, uh, especially about the meetings of the Cleveland crime family boss, Jack Licavoli, and the Carabias and some other, Ray Ferrito, and guys like that. They all met on uh, a boat on Mosquito Lake, in Trumbull County. Uh, if you grew up here in the Mahoning Valley, you, you know Mosquito Lake, but it's pretty pretty interesting to hear and to read, um, you know, how the mob would have meetings on Mosquito Lake uh, to talk about whacking Danny Green or, or, 
you know, other other items on their agenda. So, uh, Mob Nemesis by Joe Griffin. Uh, of course, Alan May's Welcome to the Jungle Inn. That was also not included on that uh, in that picture. Um, that gives a lot of good history of uh, of the Jungle Inn in the Trumbull County area. Uh, that's from our friend Alan May. And of course, you can't forget another Youngstown essential book, Inside the Vault by Emil Dinzio. This one tells you the firsthand account of robbing Richard Nixon's uh, safety deposit box in a bank in Laguna Nigel. Check that book out, Inside the Vault. The real brains of that, that whole crew was Emil Dinzio. And, you know, he really dives into that, that robbery specifically, how they pulled it off, all the nitty-gritty details. It's all in the book, Inside the Vault, available now. So Dawn included a, a few books in there. Uh, a few of them were not about Youngstown specifically, one called Five Families, another one called Mobbed Up. That gives you more general perspective on uh, the mob in general. But the real specific ones to our area, he had Rick Perello's To Kill the Irishman. Uh, great story, you know, great read about how they eventually did kill Danny Green uh, and the downfall of the Cleveland family after that. Um, he included Super Thief, uh, uh, again, by Rick Perello. This was the story of Phil Christopher, who, you know, whether you believe it or you don't believe it, he was, uh, you know, part of a lot of burglaries, a lot of heists. And Crime Town USA from Alan May, that's probably the most definitive look at Youngstown's past. It's very detailed, very detail-oriented from 1933 to 1963. There's another one on there called The Mob Informer. That's a very heavily researched book. A lot of great researchers put that thing together. I highly recommend you check that out, especially if you're interested in the history of like uh, the Calabrians and the Sicilians and how they work together with the mob in, in Youngstown and the Mahoning Valley. That's a great research book. Also in that list was Steel City Mafia, which is from a friend of ours, Paul Hodos. He's a former FBI analyst. And he wrote an entire book, just came out this year, on the Pittsburgh crime family called Steel City Mafia. So we highly recommend you check that book out. And of course, the last book he had on that list is kind of why we're here today. It's called Truth, Not Deception, The Demise of GM. And it's really about uh, an incredible uh, case. A lot of people, you know, you might have grown up in this area and never even heard about this case. If you're of a certain age, you did hear about this case, and it was very infamous. So we're going to talk about that here uh, with our special guest right after the break. Hey, Vinny, what you doing? Trying to get the stain out of the carpet. What is that? Red wine? Um, yeah, yeah, it's red wine, yeah. You should get some nice tile or terrazzo in here. Frankie, this is Youngstown. Where do you get some nice terrazzo at? I know a guy. Yeah, you know a guy. Looks really nice, doesn't it? You just could eat off it. For spectacular flooring, go bold, go local, go Youngstown Tile. All right, now I'm joined by Gary Bonnell. Thank you very much for joining me, Gary. Thank you. All right, so Gary wrote a book called Truth Not Deception. Um, it's available right now on Amazon. You can go out and get it. You know, I highly recommend it. Uh, Don Corbett, as I just mentioned earlier in the show, posted a our, our Youngstown Mob post of the week. He put a bunch of books that he said was essential reading if you want to know Youngstown Mob and organized crime history. And Gary's book is in there, uh, Truth Not Deception. So uh, thanks, Gary. Um, real quick, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself and you know why you wanted to write this book. Yes. Um Going back about 39 years, close to 40 years, I worked for General Motors in Lordstown, and that's when I became associated with uh, Ben Marsh in a situation with uh, 
Bill Milano. And uh, real quick, who was Ben Marsh? Ben Marsh was a security guard that was assigned to the van plant because of an agitator come over and spat in my face. His name was Bill Milano. And, and let's tried set, to start a fight. And let's set this up for folks as well. You worked at General Motors, Lordstown. You yes, were I was in supervision. Okay. And this was what year? Um nineteen seventy two. All right. So we're in the early nineteen seventies, which if you know your Youngstown mob, that was a pretty wild era. Um, some of the characters that controlled the area back then. So all right, we're early 1970s. We're in General Motors plant in Lordstown, Ohio. Um, big area, you know, it's a big business around these parts. Um, General Motors had a lot of sway. So what was your position? My position was foreman. Okay. Uh, supervisor. Uh, I really was assigned all over the plant at periods of time. And what did they make at this plant? Vans. G10, G20, and G30 vans. Okay, so these are, uh, you know, General Motors is pumping out these vans. How many of these vans would you say they, they pumped out in a year? Oh, about 30 an hour. 30 an hour? Yeah. Okay. So they're going, and they sent these things all over the world, right? That is correct. Okay, so this was a pretty big plant. And, you know, at a time when the Youngstown steel mills are collapsing and starting to, starting to really deteriorate and eventually fold, General Motors takes a very prominent, uh, um, you know, spotlight in, in Youngstown. Well, there was a, a key event during the time that I hired in from 70 to 72 was that the, uh, at that time, it was Chevrolet Motor Division. It was different management within management, and they did a switch of corporate uh, dominance to GMAD, General Motors Assembly Division. I see, so General Motors really took it over then from Chevrolet. Yes, because of uh, poor quality and some of the <laughs> antics that went on at the plant. Gotcha. All right, well, let's talk again about Ben Marsh. You mentioned Ben Marsh, and that's, yes. why, he, that's why you wanted to write this book. Unfortunately, Ben Marsh was murdered in 1974 Correct. in Canfield, Ohio, um, along with his wife and his young daughter, his four-year-old daughter. So tell me a little bit about Benjamin Marsh. You knew Ben. Yes, I was, uh, I, I knew the plant manager personally. It was A.B. Anderson. And when I had this gentleman come over, um, and spit it in my face and try to start a fight, I was kind of perplexed. I didn't understand what was going on. So I called Anderson up and uh, he assigned, he says, uh, I'm going to assign a security guard, which I have great faith in, was Ben Marsh. Uh, to the plant and to keep an eye on the situation, what's going on. And uh, he did that. He sent Ben over, and that was my introduction to him. Uh, actually, the first introduction was is when he <laughs> escorted Mr. Milano who was alleged, and Ben told me, he said he was alleged to be the numbers, head of the numbers narcotics ring at GM Lordstown. So uh, Ben escorted him out of the plant, but during the conversation, he spat on Ben, he spat again on me, and threatened to kill both of us and our families. Wow. So he was fired then from General Motors? Not then. Uh, they had progressive discipline, a balance in 10, a balance in 30 days. And, and I had him up to a balance in 30 days one more time. He would have been discharged. But uh, 
Ben came to me one day and we had lunch together. We had developed a good friendship there. And Ben came to me and he said, uh, I, I think there's some problems with drugs being put in the vans. And I said, okay. And he said, every, every one of the vans had a sequential number on the windshield on, on a bright paper, and I think it was a, like a yellow, showing um, what the sequence number was. Okay. And Ben said, if I call you, because I was in what was called final process, where they started the van up, pulled it off the line and either shipped it or pulled it inside repair to repair. And Ben said, if you see a van, uh, and I call down and give you the number, would you pull it in the side repair? And I said, yes, I'll do that. So a week or so went by, Ben was there, and, and again, there was a repeat of Mr. Milano coming over, spitting in our face. And, and why was he spitting in your face, to your best? We had no idea. We really didn't. And neither did Ben, but it became obvious a little bit later because uh, he didn't want Ben there, obviously. He threatened us every time that Ben escorted him out of the plant, which was a total of three, uh, threatened to kill us, threatened to kill our families. He contacted my home. Wow. Uh, called my wife up, and Mr. Milano did. And he was very, very abrasive individual. <clears throat> so... What do you say to somebody that calls you? And what Did you have any reaction? I mean, on the phone, somebody's threatening you in this manner, and just what, hung what up. do you say? You just hung up on him? Yeah. Did you call the police? No, well, no, I just hung up on him. I went to management. Okay. Over. Tell me a little bit about General Motors security because I'm I'm interested in this. After this murder happens, this we'll get to the the why and the when, but after the murder happens of Benjamin Marsh and his family, the case is investigated by Mahoning County Sheriff's, but it's also investigated by General Motors security, which I thought was kind of interesting that they had as much. Um, say in the investigation as they did. So tell me a little bit about General Motors security and, you know, what the process was. From. Well, what I knew at that point was that we escorted them out of the plant on about three occasions and had a repeat of spitting, spitting on us and um, threatened to kill, kill us and kill our yeah. families. And uh, after about the third time that it was taken out, uh, he was taken out, um, Ben called on the phone down in the final process and he said, uh, here's a certain number, it's a Blue Beauville van coming down. And he said, can you pull it to the side repair? He said, uh, I'll be down. So he obviously was on the second floor. So he came down and he said, uh, can you take the cargo door side panel off? And I said, yes, but I said, I don't know if that's a thing to do because it was very tense there coming strike time. And he said, I said, I'll take it off. So I got the air pistol and took the screws out of the trim panel, and this was a Beauville, this was a passenger van. Okay. And took the uh, side panel off, and there was a bag in there, uh, approximately a two-gallon bag, Ziploc type. And um, he pulled it out, had a white substance in it, and uh, he said, bingo. He said, is there any black sacks around here? 
And I said, right there, you know, garbage sacks. And okay. he said, we'll put it in that garbage sack. So we put it in the garbage sack, and he said, it was close to the end of the shift when this happened. And he said, oh, he said, I want the two of us to go over and see A.B. Anderson, the plant manager. Yeah. And he said, can you give him a call and tell him we're on our way? And I said, yes. So I did. And we went over and visited Mr. Anderson with the bag. Took the uh, the two gallon, approximately two gallon bag out of white substance out of the trash bag and yeah. laid it on his desk. So he looked at me and he said, uh, Gary, do you know what that is? I said, I don't do drugs. I said, I couldn't tell you. But you knew it, it was drugs, right. but you just didn't know what it was. Yeah, right. Okay. We suspected it. Mm -hmm. And he looked at Ben and he said, um, Ben, can you identify what it is? And Ben says, uh, probably. He said, if you allow me to unzip that bag and it has a flowery smell, uh, he said, I could almost guarantee it's cocaine. So you found the drugs in this van, right? Right. Let's talk real quick about since you mentioned the numbers racket and at, at, that was going on, let's fill people in who aren't aware. How many people worked at General Motors estimated at this time, the, the uh, plant in Lordstown? Between the van plant, the uh, car plant, the Vega plant, and the stamping plant, approximately 13,000. 13,000 people. So they made these vans and they made uh, Vegas. Vegas. Well, Chevy then, Vegas, right? And correct. Go ahead. And then they made parts, the okay. stampings for that. And there was about thirteen thousand people that worked there. Yes. So approximately. I know that the mob had controlled the numbers racket at the plant with the union members and basically anybody at the plant. the The mob had numbers runners in Youngstown for decades and decades. And by nineteen seventy two, I believe that was the very end. Um, of, you know, towards the end of, of the uh, of, of the numbers, the bug in Youngstown, because the, the state lottery in Ohio becomes legal not long after this. But at the time, the, the they would run the numbers, and I, I was told by guys that worked at GM that, oh, well, yeah, everybody played. Yeah, everybody played. You had to play. Everybody played. Everybody played. I've heard that a lot from people I've talked to. So it was pretty lucrative. And I know that even later, in later years, it becomes a bargaining chip amongst mobsters. Oh, I'll give you the numbers racket at Lordstown. Uh, that's a deal that Joey Naples promises somebody later on in you know future years. So it was very lucrative. And at that time, I want to set up too, because again, our audience is pretty knowledgeable about the mob in Youngstown. The guys that controlled that the areas back then, you had... Cleveland and Pittsburgh, the, the family members, representatives for these families. You had Trumbull County, which is where Lordstown technically is, uh, right there where Lordstown, uh, Trumbull County and Mahoning County kind of come together. Uh, it's pretty close, but it was still Trumbull County, and Trumbull County was Cleveland territory. And the, the people that ran most of the gambling out of... Um, the Cleveland family, you know, at that time, we're talking 1972, Tony Del Saner, Tony Dope Del Saner was kind of the overlord of Trumbull County. He had the Carabia brothers were doing work for him. There was Joe Perfetti that did a lot of gambling operations in, in Trumbull County. And, you know, you're mentioning uh, Mr. Milano here at, at GM was a representative of the numbers racket. So they also had... And he was also a union rep. There you go. There's a lot of union ties and, and mob ties. Everybody knows those. But they also had prostitution on the overnight shifts, which is another big mob racket, of course, in Youngstown for years and years. Um, you know, there's that's, that's all in his book. There's other stuff that we're not going to talk about that's in his book, Truth, Not Deception. So you can check that out. Again, it's on Amazon. Um, get a copy of it. Read it for yourself. But 
Let's move a little forward now. So Ben Marsh, we've established that he is the security guard at GM, that he's an ambitious guy, law enforcement aspirations. Um, he is going to testify, let's jump to that point, uh, of a grand jury investigation into what's going on at GM Lordstown. There were other things involved as well. I know uh, fencing operations, Lordstown was also big. I, I asked people who worked at Lordstown back in the day, I always ask them, did you, did, I'm sure you, you got something off a truck at some point. <laughs> Because the trucks that I always heard stories that there was always trucks there, uh, with with you know goods that you could fenced and you know clean. Well, before <laughs> the Marsh murders, the uh, Mr. Anderson said he'd get back with me and verify with the FBI that that in fact was cocaine, and it was. Yes. And to my demise, about a week after that. I was called into the office and accused of pulling a knife on a guy. And I busted out laughing because I, I'd been promoted five times in nine months and I was up for a promotion to general foreman. And they said, this isn't fun and games. Uh, you have a choice of either quitting or being fired. And I said, for what? They said, for pulling a knife on this hippie. <laughs> and I said, I'm willing to take a polygraph test to yeah. verify Clear my name. innocence. Uh, they said, no, you don't have a choice. So that was pretty quick response. And how, yeah, how long uh, after that incident where, they, where you found the drugs, how long was that? Couple of weeks. Wow. I'm going to go back to the Ben Marsh grand jury. Uh, this is 19, would this have been 73 or 74? That was in 1974 prior to him being murdered. Yes. Okay. On North Turner Road, which is where the Marshes lived in Canfield. That is correct. Now, it's interesting. I've seen, you know, news clips and that crime scene, they let the news guys in at that time to go right up to the bed and to the, to they, the scene they contaminated in the, house. the the crime it was scene. it was not very uh yeah it, it was very contaminated scene um before we i don't want to jump too far ahead either because we did we haven't even mentioned mr ferrari yet so we'll we'll kind of back it up a little bit um we'll go back to this grand jury real quick at the same time that there was an investigation underway into the marsh murders there was a case that had kind of gone cold at that point for maybe a year or, or that same year uh, in Youngstown, a murder of a, of a guy who ran a, a gas station and allegedly a chop shop in Youngstown. Uh, he was a fence um, for some mob-connected guys as well. His name was Talbert. He was an informant for the ATF who was uh, supposedly going to testify in a grand jury as well, and he was killed shortly before the marshes three months before that is correct wow and he had a son that became a detective in salem who had investigated his father's death yes dave talbert you know, there was a there was some connection found between he and marsh yes um i spoke with dave had a, developed a good relationship with him and he said that his father uh, uh, the Ben Morris, in fact, was present at the grand jury in Cleveland wow. before his father got murdered. The same grand jury? Same grand jury. That this, that this fence, Talbert, uh, was going to testify, and Ben Marsh was also there to testify. So this is interesting. So now you have the security guard who is going to testify and people don't want him to talk. So what do they do? They hire a hitman or a killer or somebody to come in and kill him. Now, Ben Marsh worked the overnight shift at his job and came home and slept during the day. Correct. And so they must have known this, whoever, whoever committed this act. Um, 
they come to his house out in Canfield, break into his house through a side door of the garage. Whoever did this broke into the house, kicked in a screen door to get into the house from the garage, went to the bedroom, found Ben Marsh there, killed him um, pretty violently and very horrifically. But sometime when this was happening, Mrs. Marsh, Marilyn Marsh, came home with her two children. That is correct. And you might have heard me say before this was a triple murder. It's because there were three people killed, but there were four people in the family. So there was Benjamin Marsh, who was uh, 33, I believe, or 30. How old was Ben Marsh when he died? I, mean, I think he was 33. And Marilyn Marsh was around the same age, around that same age. And then you had um, four-year-old Heather Marsh and a, a young baby boy as well. One-year-old. And so the killer has just killed Ben Marsh in his bed, in his own bed, in his house. And he goes to leave, and the family comes home, tragically. Um, they kill the mother, shot her. She died. Then they horrifically killed the four-year-old daughter with a, the butt of the gun. And they did not kill the baby, although they left this baby there. And this crime scene sits for, I believe, 30-something hours. 20 hours that they okay. figure that uh, Christopher, the one-year-old, one plus. He was alone for 20 old. hours? It, yeah. Okay. So I, he crawled in the blood. Thank you for correcting me on that. So he's alone. That's so sad. But he's alone in this scene, um, and the person fled. The person actually, whoever committed this murder, took Heather... I'm sorry, Marilyn Marsh's car from their garage and later dumped it at a Kmart in Austin Town, which is a suburb of Youngstown, um, right off of Mahoning Avenue there. Clarify, so, 30 hours later. Th that's what the 30 hours was. So there was that was 30 hours later this car is found in Kmart. Someone allegedly saw, a woman saw someone near the car or getting out of the car and they made a composite sketch, which changes a few times over the investigation. But there was somebody, you know, witnessed around that car that got out of that car. And, uh, and that made the investigation later. And we'll get to that in a second. But that was the scene. So we know, if you know Canfield Township, North Turner Road, it's kind of out there in, you know, country area. Whoever killed them took her car and left because they needed a, a, a ride to leave. There was snow outside. This is a winter in Ohio and Youngstown. And they took this car and they dumped it somewhere else. Well, that tells us right away that someone else brought them to this, to this you know, crime scene and probably panicked when the family came home and left them there. So... You know, there was some evidence found at the scene, including a cigarette butt that had been lit on both ends. That is correct. There was DNA, two DNAs on the cigarette butt. There was 10 sets of fing different fingerprints of people that they pulled from this house. Um, but again, if you saw the news footage, the crime scene was stepped all over, walked through by many law enforcement agencies, many... Uh, media members, many, many people that probably shouldn't have been in there were in there. Um, and the, that was the scene. But he was a friend of yours. I want to go to your personal connection here. When Benjamin Marsh was killed, how did you find out? I received a call from uh, A.B. Anderson, your the former, plant manager. Your, your plant manager in Lordstown. At Lordstown from California and told me of the murders. So now he had left as well. He was in California. Yes, and he said he was threatened also. Wow. So he notified you of the murders, and, and what was your what did you think? What, what, what you know? I was I was really shocked because Ben and I, when the time from the time I left, 
was obviously about two years until he was murdered. Mm-hmm. All kept in contact. Ben would come over every week, every other week, and have lunch with me, and we'd sit down and talk about yeah. what was going on. He said it was a blessing that you left. He said it's getting pretty, pretty bad over there. And I said, uh, I asked him a question. I said, are you, are you involved with the FBI? And he said, yes, he was a confidential informant. And I said, well, where, where was the drugs? Where were the drugs coming from? And he said, they were coming from Columbia, being stored in trash cans in Florida in the backyards, and how they discovered that was that there was a flood in Florida, and the trash cans were buoyant, floated to the top of the surface, and that's how they discovered it. Well, that's a, that's a, the whole, the narcotics stuff here, the flow of narcotics into the area, you know, that's a whole other episode of Youngstown Mob Talk with um, the the Colombian connection and, and all that that they had there was that's a that's a pretty big thing but we'll stick with GM and and this tragic case and, and your book for this episode the vindicator the newspaper had been covering it um, seems like a pretty big case GM is a big big force in the valley the Mahoning Valley who investigated the case after after the murders the, the Mahoning County Sheriff's Department and it was but I be, I believe that GM had also had some kind of uh, role in the investigation. Yes, and a matter of fact, that's part of the title of my book. Where is the GM Marsh murder file? At the time uh, of the uh, of this investigation, the Mahoning County Sheriff's detective, who was in charge here, was Ed Nemeth. Now, if you're from Youngstown, Mahoning Valley, that name's familiar. We'll tell you why in a little bit. But Ed Nemeth was the detective who was in charge of, of this investigation, he took good notes. We know that because they came out later in, the tr- in this trial, but the investigators get a tip that one of their files on a possible informant is going to be stolen. Now, explain this to me because I still don't quite understand this either. They get a tip, the, this is a GM security person gets a tip that their file is going to get stolen from his car because he keeps it in his car. Mr. McIntosh was the individual that was head of plant security at General Motors. He and Mr. Nemeth worked hand in glove in the sting operation that was about to appear. So the head of security at General Motors is working with the, the Mahoning County Sheriff's detective on the investigation. Uh, and they get a tip that someone is going to steal one of their files on a potential informant. And again, I just don't understand why he would keep it in his car on the lot there in Lordstown. It didn't, that didn't, you know, maybe, I don't know. Maybe he didn't, I don't, trust, I, I don't maybe he didn't trust anywhere in the plant. I don't think anybody does because the original GM murder file was uh, eventually placed in the vault in the safe at GM plant security that was the last known place it was it was housed so they get this tip that this this file is going to be stolen and again this file allegedly might give away uh, an informant's name or identity and they, they get a tip that it's going to be stolen, this file. Well, Ed Nemeth actually comes up with a pretty good idea, which is, okay, if they're going to steal our file, let's create a dummy file for them, and we'll do a sting. We'll do a sting operation. We'll, we'll set these guys up. Whoever stole this, we'll set them up. So they do that. They make a dummy file. And in the dummy file, it says that they have a witness, and the witness's name is... X, Y, Z, and that he's staying at a hotel nearby. Well, they plant this fake file in the, in the head of the security at GM's car, and sure enough, his car gets broken into. Correct. And someone steals this. This is like a scene from a strange movie at this point. Someone steals this 
file with the fake witness's name on it. So now the now they're thinking with this investigation, they have to be thinking, great, we got them. So they set up a sting at this hotel, and Ed Nemeth himself, the detective, is going undercover to portray the fake witness. He stays at this hotel for, I believe it was a few nights, and he gets a phone call in his room maybe on the third night, and it's somebody breathing heavily on the other end. And so he knows, okay, you know, somebody's, the jig is up, something's going to happen. Well, the sting operation had the outside of the motel watched so that if anybody came to the door, they'd spring out and catch these guys. Well, that's what happened. And three gentlemen came to the door, and the police sprung out, the sheriff sprung out and, and, and got them. And uh, who were those gentlemen? There were four people total. There was three at the door. Um, they were Robert Parks, Paul Parks, and Mr. Ferris. So Robert Parks, Paul Parks, and, and Eddie Ferris. And to give you guys uh, some background here, uh, Bobby Parks, as he was known, uh, was a notorious killer, uh, hired gunman in Youngstown, literally had a business card uh, that said, have gun will travel, and I believe that was a nod to, what was that, an old western or something, right? Um, and so he had a brother named Paul Parks who was alleged to be involved with him, and there was a former Mahoning County Sheriff's deputy who was fired named Eddie Ferris, Ed Ferris, Correct. who was part of uh, with them as well. Now, if you're in the Youngstown Mob Facebook group, um, you'll probably see have seen some newspaper articles. Maybe you recognize uh, Eddie Ferris. Um, he later, in later years, gets uh, on an FBI tape recording saying that he was offered the contract on Joey Naples, but he turned it down because he wanted the money up front and they were offering him territory and such. So he was uh, uh, suspected in a few hits around Youngstown. But the Parks brothers, and specifically Bobby Parks, was such a, a uh, infamous person amongst law enforcement officials. Um, and, he, you know, you talk to any police that came across Bobby Parks and they have nothing good to say about the man. Um, but he ended up dying in prison for two murders that he committed uh, in Girard in the 80s, in Girard, Ohio, when he was hired to kill a dentist and the dentist's wife or new wife or girlfriend. And um, he killed, I believe, two people, shot the dentist, and he didn't die. But uh, Mr. Parks was prosecuted for those crimes. His wife flipped, and uh, she was the, the main witness against him. And he went to life, served life in prison, and died in prison. Um, 2010. Now, I want to go back to this investigation. These are the guys that show up at the hotel door where Detective Ed Nemeth is inside pretending to be this guy. So he opens the door, sees these three guys. They, the cops come out. The, the sheriffs come out. They arrest these guys. What happens then? They arrested not only those three, but down at the corner of the street of the block was Mr. Spanetti, Mr. Span. What's his name, his full name? Um, I couldn't tell you his first name. I believe William Spanetti. Because there was a few, he had brothers as there well. Were, there were two brothers, that's correct. But this was a William Spann, is, is how I, in my research, I came across Correct. the name William Spann. And he was down at the corner, supposedly, with the guns. Um, he bragged about that he was going to, uh, that they were going to murder whoever was in that room. Who did, allegedly did he brag this to? Um, to my understanding, it's in the police report that okay. he made the made the comments, but who appears but the mob attorney, none other than Mr. Kerman Policy. 
Okay. And to my understanding, he appeared on the scene, according to the transcript in my book. And they walk. Again, before we go any further, this is all in a trial transcript, and we'll get to this, this trial. But this is all in the transcript that is available on Gary's website, um, truthnotdeception.com. You can actually download the trial transcript. It's a very great resource. 900-some pages. And so if you want to dig into more of this, the, the case that we're talking about here. So I'll, I'll come back now. The three gentlemen at the door, and the four of them, I guess, all together, they get arrested. Um, at least the three at the door do, I know. And they get pulled in and arrested and sprung. A lawyer comes, takes them out, right? And nothing ever happens. This case goes cold. Now, this is their lead suspect, this guy, Bobby Parks. Um, you know, a notorious, like I said, a notorious killer. Had, had killed a guy, I believe, at the end of the 60s and got sentenced to a pretty stiff sentence, but then got out within like a year you know, they was reduced to a manslaughter charge, and he got out, uh, killed a man named Packner um, in, on Glenwood. Uh, was Walter a, Packner. Walter Packner was a um, Wells Fargo security guard, I believe. Um, so, but he got out of prison right after that, and his name has been attached to something like 40 murders, not just in Ohio. We're talking Bobby Parks. Not just in Ohio but on the West Coast as well. Bragged about it in jail that he committed 42 homicides. He's their number one suspect. They got him at the motel, but they had to let him go. There was no guns. That's what they said in the police report. In Ed Nemeth's report, it says that they were released. They had no weapons with them. They were questioned. The lawyer came in. They were released. But we mentioned the name Talbert earlier. Um, Rob Talbert, who was murdered around the same time that Benjamin Marsh was murdered, and was also going to testify before a grand jury, had two sons. And they both investigated their father's murder for many, many years. Yes. And, you know, Rob Talbert Jr., correct me if I'm wrong. Correct. Was actually in touch with Ed Nemeth the former uh, detective who investigated this case. And he asked him about Bobby Parks, who he had, they had caught at the motel. Tell him what he said. Robert Talbert Jr. was speaking with Ed Nemeth, and Ed Nemeth said that Robert Parks which makes sense, was never without a gun, turn around and had a sawed-off shotgun under his trench coat wow. when, he, when he entered the motel room. And we talked to, you know, the, the, the Talberts as well. It's crazy to me that, you know, Ed Nemeth, who at that point becomes the Mahoning County Sheriff, and he's actually later implicated for taking mafia money. I don't think it was ever prosecuted. I don't think it was ever... Uh, um, worked for Ray T. Davis. He worked for Ray T. Davis, a sheriff as well, who was also corrupt. And at, at that point, up until, you know, through uh, Phil Chance, you know, corrupt Mahoning County Sheriff, who surprisingly was one of the sheriff's detectives who worked the Marsh case, you know, a lot of those guys from trafficking on... You know, they, they all were, were taking money from for years and years. Ed Nemeth, I don't believe, and I could be wrong on this, that he was ever prosecuted, but, you know, um, he was definitely implicated. Um, but well, what was also very strange was that um, within a year or so after the murders, both McIntosh, head of uh, GM security, McIntosh's daughter, and... It was never publicized, but it was found in his obituary by the Talberts that he, in fact, worked at the Oklahoma Citation Plant 
alongside of Macintosh. Ed Nemeth. Ed Nemeth, yes. So, yeah, this is where it gets, it just keeps getting stranger, this case, the more you, 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 you pull at the string. The Ed Nemeth was the detective, again, from the, the Mahoney County Sheriff's Office, who investigated this case in 1974. Uh, the case eventually goes cold. Did, did Bobby Parks have a gun with him on the night he was arrested? Did he not have a gun? You know, Ed Nemeth, either way, the case goes cold. He leaves the sheriff's department and goes down, where was it? To Oklahoma. To Oklahoma. To the, the GM, gets General a, Motors Citation Plant. Gets a job at GM with the guy that he was investigating the case with, McIntosh. R correct. And then after all of that, comes back to Mahoning County and becomes the sheriff. And again, if you know Mahoning County politics in the past, in that mob era, the sheriff's position was always corrupted. For years and years it was corrupted. Correct. From Ray T. Davis yeah, up. So, you know, and probably before that as well. But uh, it's just coincidence. Is it not coincidence? I mean, it, it, there's too many coincidences in this case to say that. So, uh Let's move on and let's say, okay, the case goes cold for almost 40 years. Correct. And then suddenly uh, in 2013, a gentleman by the name of James Ferrara is charged and convicted of the crime of killing the Marsh family. Now, James Ferrara was already serving life in prison. Um, he admitted to killing two men in a drug robbery gone wrong in 1983. That's correct. Uh, in Columbus, um, James Ferrara worked for General Motors, Lordstown, um, from 1970 until he was arrested in 83. And, and he was with another guy from Lordstown, GM Lordstown, when they did this drug robbery, a gentleman by the name of Joey Weeks. That is correct. And, uh, and a He was a union committee man. And a third member uh, or, uh, of the crime. Uh, Mr. Jennings. Mark Jennings. So these guys go down to Columbus, and they're there to rob two drug dealers of cocaine in a pretty big deal. Um, according to Ferrara, he was brought with these guys kind of as just to be muscle with a guy with a gun. And Ferrara has no prior record to this, no, nothing that ever shows he was in any trouble. He actually served um, in Vietnam, In Vietnam was an honorable discharge. Correct. Um, so he was, you know, had a good job at GM and he was connected in there in the union. Um, up to that point, he had no prior record. So they get caught after this drug robbery gone wrong. Um, according to Ferrara, uh, these guys started to fight back, and he shot his way out, and he killed these guys. Um, when they when they all get arrested a short time later, Ferrara admits to it, pleads guilty, and is sentenced to life in prison um, because at that time the death penalty in Ohio was abolished. So that's the background on Ferrara. He's serving life in prison uh, for over 30 years, when suddenly some cold case detectives show up and, uh, and start taking his fingerprints and questioning him about the Marsh murders. Um, tell me, yeah, first of all, how do you know James Ferrara? We didn't, we, uh, tell me about that. Um, I established a uh, telephone conversation with him which uh, a phone account after his conviction oh yes yes and then i went down and interviewed mr ferrara and now you at worked at the marion prison you both worked at gm lordstown at the same and time. never knew each other yeah and we, and we as we established gm lordstown at that time about thirteen thousand people were yeah but there. It, he was in the van plant at the yeah. same time i was supposedly and i never knew him okay so but so your time crossed over. You, there might have been times where you passed each other and never knew it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so now all these years later, he's been convicted of killing the Marsh family. Now, we should also specify the 
the evidence that uh, was used against him, they said that they had recovered, and we know this from the old Ed Nemeth investigation, they had 10 or so different sets of prints or different people, uh, fingerprints that they found from the crime scene. Um, again, as we talked about, that crime scene was walked all over by members of many different uh, law enforcement agencies as well as media members. Um, very kind of uh, not, not well-kept crime scene. So of all the evidence that's there, they said they have fingerprints outside the door that was broken into the, the side garage door. Uh, they say they have fingerprints of Ferraras on that door. Now, it was also snowing at the time, and there was a boot print. And they had a boot uh, print from when the, the killer kicked in the garage screen door to get into the house. They had a boot print there. So these are the, the evidence that they use against Ferrara in his trial. Um, this boot print never comes up in the trial. It's never measured against his foot. So whether or not it even matched him, it, that never came out. It never, it never uh, was used. Nor of any of the prints in the snow. There you go. So the, then the fingerprints, uh, we know that in 2009, these cold case detectives started investigating the case. Correct. Um, again, you know, if, if you're listening, if you're, if you're a detective on this case, you want to talk about this case, we'd love to talk to you more. Uh, reach out to us, please. Um, you know, fill us in if we, if we got something wrong on this part. Uh, but we know that in 2009, the detectives reach out to Ferrara. They bring him to the Mahoning County Jail. Correct. And they fingerprint him and, and do a DNA swab. Correct. Um, no DNA evidence matched anything inside the house. Um, but they did say they had three fingerprints. Right. Essentially, Ferrara was convicted um, with testimony of a, another sheriff, uh, a deputy. Trainee. Okay, who, who said that he had a conversation about guns with Ferrara and these fingerprints, and, and that was enough for the jury. Now, Ferrara has denied from day one that he had anything to do with this case. Um, you know, took great offense to the notion that he killed a child, um, but said he never had never been to this house, uh, didn't know Marsh, and, you know, was innocent of these crimes. So he's maintained his innocence since day one. Uh, and again, this is a guy who pled guilty to his other crimes and admitted to killing those other two guys and is serving life in prison, you know, as we speak and as he was being uh, put on and, trial. And they never did a polygraph test to Mr. Ferrara. Okay, so so clearly, again, it was the evidence, the, the main evidence used against him was these fingerprints. Correct. So he was a, a convicted in 2013, and was he sentenced, do you know what, what the sentence was? Do you remember? Yeah, life. So he was already serving life in prison, so they just tacked on life. You're never getting out, that kind of... Right. Yeah. So... Because he, he could have been paroled at that time, especially during the COVID. He would have been paroled. Paroled for the first crime. Yeah. From 40 years ago. So, 50 years ago at this point. Jeez. So... Fellas. All right. Well, it's, you know, Gary ends up getting subpoenaed and... Could have been a witness in the in in the Ferrara trial. Uh, you tell me you you brought up. Um, they the, did the cold case detectives reach out to you or did you reach out to them? They reached out to me. And what what did what were they interested in you? What what did you say that was they, so interesting? They were interested in the Marsh murders. The the stories that you told us earlier from your time working at GM and the death threats made against you and and Marsh. Correct. And so they, the, the detectives then are thinking, okay, we have, a, we have somebody here that can, that can, what, testify to, what do you think that they, that they even subpoenaed you for? I, I don't have a clue. I really don't have a clue. The only thing is after they did interview me for two hours, they said they were going to call a grand jury and they didn't do it. Yeah. And, the, and I asked him the reason why, and Mr. Mondora said because 
Mr. Gaines did not like my eight-page letter to the chairman of the board. So I said, I bet he didn't. So um, back it up again. This is would be the the prosecutor at the time, Paul Gaines, who again, if you're if you're if you know um, Youngstown Mob Talk or Crooked City, uh, you're familiar with our former prosecutor who was, you know, had a long career, 25-year career as prosecutor. You wrote. You're saying that you wrote an eight-page letter to whom? To the chairman of the board, of Thomas the, Murphy, of General, General Motors, Motors and the numero uno, and the president, to the two of them, the president, Pete Estes, of General Motors. And when did you write this? Um, I'd have to look at the date. Estimated, what would you say, 2013, right after this? Oh, no, no, before. no, no. This letter I mean, was uh, written written prior to me returning to General Motors. Okay, so years. Okay. Yeah. So you had then been, so let's fast forward, you've been subpoenaed in this case um, to be a witness to possibly testify to give background information, I guess, um, on these threats that were made against Mr. Marsh. We're assuming, because Gary was never called in the trial, um, you were actually sequestered. I was sequestered. I wasn't allowed to be in that room. Okay. And so you never you never come to, to testify. You're not the only one on the witness list who doesn't testify in this case. There's actually a few other a few other names that just the witnesses were never called. Um, it's interesting. I, I've actually begun my own investigation of this case. It's a it's a pretty you know involved thing. There's a lot of. Uh, Coincidences, if you believe in coincidences, there's a lot of that in this case. There's a lot of, you know, go, all the way going back to the, the, the Bobby Parks thing, you've got so much in this book, um, prior background information about your time at GM, uh, everything about the Marsh case, some, you know, there's photos in, in the book, there, uh, things that are um, And the files. fact they tried to take my life. It's a pretty wild book, and it's, you know, it, it, as somebody who tells stories for a living, you see why I'm interested in this case. I mean, there's there's just so much to it. Um, and so I, I'm kind of doing an investigation as well into this and saying, you know, it's an interesting part of that era, and, and as we do Youngstown Mob Talk, it's not directly the mob as opposed to you know, there are mob elements to it, mob rackets, mob higher forces controlling things, calling shots. Who ordered the Marsh murder? You know, that may have very well been directed, you know, m more directly associated with the mobsters of the era that we think. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely interested. You know, I'm glad I got your book here. And uh, it is definitely worth a read. It's available on Amazon. You can actually find the whole trial transcript from the James Farrar case on truthnotdeception.com. Gary's done a lot of great, you know, uh, uh, legwork to get that for us. Um, it, it's really interesting stuff. Gary, thank you for coming on Youngstown Mob Talk. You're welcome. All right, once again, we'll be joined next week uh, by our my partner in true crime, Jimmy Naples. Jim and I are historians, too. And that leads me to our, we're doing a big show, of course, in November. We highly recommend you come check this out. It's called Cav Bomb, A Blast from the Past. This is Friday, November 10th at the Stambaugh Auditorium. We've got some special guests for this show. Uh, our focus of the show is the mafia war in Youngstown specifically that went from 1960 to 1962. And several big-named uh, gangsters from this area were killed, were eliminated as part of this war. And it really started with the death of Sandy Naples and his girlfriend, and it ends with the mafia car bombing of Cadillac Charlie Cavallero, and unfortunately his two young sons who were in the car with him. We've actually got the sole survivor of that bombing, Charlie Jr., coming to our show. He's our featured guest. He's going to tell you details that you know maybe he's never told publicly ever. So uh, we've also got the last surviving FBI agent to work the case, Cecil Moses. He'll be there as another guest of honor for us. And it all starts with a VIP dinner that night. Uh, we recommend you get a VIP dinner ticket because Jimmy Mullador, 
uh, Briar Hill Jimmy, the Vegas player himself, a fantastic musician uh, from Youngstown, from Briar Hill. He made his career out in Las Vegas with Elvis and Sinatra and Streisand. But before he did all that, he was here in Youngstown, and he actually grew up with the Naples brothers. So you're going to have dinner. He's going to tell you stories and jokes. He's kind of like an Italian Don Rickles. And he's going to tell you some great stories about growing up with the Naples brothers. During this dinner, he'll play some music. And then we'll actually get to the show uh, in the main auditorium at Stambaugh. And, you know, if you went to the dinner, you'll have just heard a bunch of stories about the Naples brothers. And now you'll actually find out kind of how that plays into the the turf war there from the 1960s. So that show, again, is called Cav Bomb. You can get tickets now. They're on sale. You can either get them at the box office or you can get them at stambaughauditorium.com. We'll put a link in the description below. Please check that out. We hope to see all of our mob associates Friday, November 10th. Cadillac Charlie's coming back to the north side. So we got Charlie Jr. You don't want to miss it. It's a once in a lifetime event. Don't miss it. All right. Once again, thank you to our sponsors. Um, Sunrise Inn out in Warren. Get yourself some good food. Of course, River Rock at the Amp. They did a great show, all a great series all summer long. And Youngstown Tile and Terrazzo. Some amazing flooring. Check them out. Um, until next time, I'm Johnny Ciccatelli. Ciao. That was an amazing podcast from an amazing podcast company. If you enjoyed the show, please click the like and subscribe buttons and share it with your friends. It goes a long way in helping us produce more amazing content.